Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. I do have one quick favor before we get to the video that you came here for, and that is very simply this. You see that little red subscribe button below this video? Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. It really does help me. It really does help this channel grow and my audience grow. So go ahead and hit that red subscribe button. And now, here is the video that you came here for. I said I do want to switch gears, and I do want to hit on some college hoops, and I want to kind of hit on it in an abstract way. And as I told you a minute ago, it's May, and the one good thing about May is that it does allow us to do things a little bit differently and to do things on this show that we wouldn't normally get to do, the Tom Brady stuff a minute ago. And on Tuesday, something else in the world of sports happened that I really believe is worth discussing, at least for this show. And that was that Jim Calhoun celebrated his 80th birthday, the former UConn head basketball coach. The reason I want to talk about it, I've talked about Jim Calhoun a million times, but Jim Calhoun, I would argue, is not only the reason that I am the college basketball fan that I am, but also the sports fan that I am. You could not grow up in the 1990s when I was growing up in Connecticut and not just be obsessed with UConn basketball in the same way that if you're growing up in Kansas right now, it's impossible not to be caught up in the Jayhawks, or in Kentucky right now, impossible not to be caught up in the Wildcats, or if you live in Alabama, unless you're a diehard Auburn fan, you obviously, you're following Alabama football day by day by day by day by day. And so a big part of the reason that I am the fan that I am is because of UConn basketball. When I really started to understand sports and figure out what everything meant and this win means that and this tournament is this, that was when UConn was really starting to take off. 94-95 was really the first season that I really remember a little bit of. UConn makes an Elite Eight, loses to UCLA, the eventual national champion. Following year, the first year that I really followed it and I knew the players and I knew the background, they make the Sweet 16. 98, they make the Elite Eight again. In 1999, they win the school's first national championship. So I'm forever indebted to Jim Calhoun. Love him, love his program. And I've often argued that I believe that he is the most underrated coach in the history of college basketball based on the stats that he put up conference championships, Final Fours, national championships, but then also based on where he did it and how he did it. He didn't go to a school that had a track record of four or five coaches before him that had all had success. UConn was a nice little regional program that really was at the bottom of the Big East when he got there, built them into a national power, and at the very least, I think he's the greatest program builder ever, taking the worst program arguably in the Big East, turning him into a three-time national champion. And so I'm using all of that as a setup to say this. On Tuesday, I started to have a conversation both <laughs> with myself, which sounds weird, but more importantly, I put it out on social media. I said, couldn't you argue that Jim Calhoun is the, th when you factor in everything, couldn't you argue that Jim Calhoun is the third greatest coach in the history of college basketball, behind only John Wooden and Coach K, when you factor in where he did it, how much he won, all that good stuff. And I was very surprised to see most people kind of agree with me. At the very least, they said he's underrated. Some said he's even better than Coach K, should be top three, should be top five for sure. And so what I wanted to do, again, because it's May and we can do some different stuff on this show, this is what I decided to do. I said, you know what? Screw it. Let's have some fun. What I wanted to do was put together my definitive list of the top five coaches in college basketball history. And the reason I want to do it is because it's like anything else. It's like the top five players in the NBA, the top five quarterbacks in the NFL. Everybody has kind of their different opinion. And what I want to do is put it all on paper and give you my definitive list of who I believed to be the five best coaches in college basketball. This is a concept based off of the fact that it is Jim Calhoun's 80th birthday part, the 80th birthday and I wanted to go ahead and celebrate. So let me get into my top five. Before I do, I'll give you some quick, quick criteria into what my thoughts were on, this, you know, on this, this segment and how I graded the top five. And I think it's relatively impossible to do this, right? Everybody's criteria is a little bit different, but, but this was my criteria in putting together my top five coaches in the history of college basketball. First of all, I tried to put aside the era in which stuff was done, okay? We all kind of understand that no one could do what John Wooden did in the 1960s and 70s in the modern college basketball era. Like, we all get that. We all get you can't win 10 championships in 12 years, but it shouldn't take away from the fact that he did do it in his era and that he still had to do it no matter how hard it was or how easy it was in that era. So I want to take away era. I wanted to try and balance regular season and tournament success. We all know the NCAA tournament is crazy. If a guy has a few less Final Fours than that guy, da-da-da-da, um, you know, I wanted to factor that in. 
And then most importantly, I wanted to factor in who they were and where they did it. Like I said, it's easy for somebody to take over. It's easier for somebody to take over at Kansas or UCLA or Kentucky than it is at UConn or what Lute Olson did at Arizona or what Jerry Tarkanian did at UNLV where it had never been done before. So what I want to do, I want to go through my top five. Before we do, there were two guys that just missed the cut. I went through everything and two guys just missed the cut. Number seven is Dean Smith. And I think, you know, this was kind of why I wanted to do this list, right? Because if you just said greatest coaches ever, the first two or three names out of everybody's mouth, Coach K, John Wooden, Dean Smith, maybe Roy Williams, maybe Adolph Rupp. I have Dean Smith at number seven. I think if anything, he's kind of maybe a little bit overrated historically. Not that he's terrible. UNC fans are going to get all up in my mentions. Oh my God, you hate North Carolina. Screw you. No, I'm just saying, the guy coached forever, two national championships, but the thing that if you, that, that's why you have to knock him a little bit. Everybody ahead of him on this list has more national championships, and Dean Smith being at North Carolina, the premier program in the sport for many of the years that he was there, did only, only quote unquote, take home two national championships. So that's why I think he's maybe a tiny bit overrated. If you ask most people, I think they'd say top two, top three all time, and I think he's more in that top five to seven range. What cannot be disputed, however, is the success that he had and the length with which that he did it over a period of time, which is just incredible. 17 ACC regular season titles, 13 ACC regular uh, ACC tournament titles, and then right up until Coach K this year, he was tied for the most final fours of all time prior to Coach K this, this year with 11. So Coach K surpassed him, but he had 11 Final Fours. So I can't discredit what Dean Smith did. 11 Final Fours, 17 ACC regular season titles, 13 ACC tournament titles. Uh, I have him at number seven. Incredible career. The guys ahead of him, though, are just a little bit better. Number six, I'm actually going to kind of go in that same vein. I'm going to go with Bob Knight. And Bob Knight, first of all, I'm not an anti-Bob Knight guy by any stretch. A lot of people, oh, Bob Knight, he's this, he's that. If you are of a certain age, and even if you're my age or younger, you only know Bob Knight as the guy that was on ESPN yelling and screaming or the guy that you've seen throwing chairs or whatever. Do yourself a favor over the summer when you have a little bit of free time, go ahead and buy A Season on the Brink by John Feinstein was written. It was a season embedded with Indiana basketball in 1986. And it's going to show you a whole new side of Bob Knight. I mean, this guy was in that era of college basketball larger than life and just absolutely incredible. And he was like the revered, no question about it, best coach in the sport. Everybody respected him. Everybody feared him. He was coming off a, a gold medal win in the Olympics. And so I have nothing but respect for Bob Knight. So this isn't like a tear down Bob Knight segment. Um, but, you know, he's right on the outside of the top five for, for a couple reasons. One, first of all, the, the numbers are incredible. Three national championships, five final fours, as I said, he led the U.S. to an Olympic gold in 1984 and 11 Big Ten regular season titles. Originally, I had him in the top five, but the more I looked at it, the more I do think you can knock him on one thing. I do think that by the tail end of his career, the game had kind of passed him by. The one thing that you'll notice about all the guys ahead of him, they were able to have success relatively late into their careers, where Bob Knight coached until 2008. His final Final Four was 1992, his final Big Ten title was 1993. His final Big Ten conference title or conference title in general was 1993. He obviously coached several years at Texas Tech. But I bring it up because his final 13 years as a head coach, zero Final Fours, zero national championships, zero Elite Eights in his final 13 years, one Sweet 16, one second weekend in the NCAA tournament, zero conference championships. So no criticism of Bob Knight. It's no criticism of Bob Knight. Instead, it's the exact opposite. We're going to go ahead and give him credit. We're going to put him at number six. I think the fact that the back end of his career, he really just seemed to lose touch, not able to kind of have the same success, had three national championships over an 11-year span, but could not continue it over the tail end of his career. So let's get into the top five. And let's start with number five. Drum roll, please. This one was actually surprising, and this was the guy that I had outside the top five, and I replaced... Bob, I had Bob Knight in the top five, and I replaced this guy. And that person is, are you ready for this? It's Roy Williams. <laughs> that was a little dramatic, even for me. That was a little dramatic. So what I would say about Roy Williams is pretty straightforward. I think there's an easy argument to be made. Oh, Roy Williams, he's overrated, blah, blah, blah. And the knock and the reason that I had him out of the top five originally was because he only coached at two places, Kansas and North Carolina, which are unquestionably two of the top five jobs in college basketball. 
and that was the knock on him forever, is that if any coach coached at those two schools, they would win a lot of games. To which I would say, I don't think that's necessarily wrong where there were a lot of guys that could have had success if they started at 40 at one place and coached 30 years. But there's also Billy Gillespie. There's also Steve Lavin. There's also Ben Howland. There's also Matt Doherty. There's also literally everyone that's coached in Indiana since Bob Knight left. Maybe Mike Effin Woodson is the guy. But sit here and say, like, Roy Williams should be punished because he had a ton of success at two places where a lot of people have success. I don't think we can hold it against him. And the more that I looked at Roy Williams' resume, the more that I looked at, again, those countable stats, the unbelievable stats that he put up over the course of his career, I was like, there's no way I can justify putting Bob Knight ahead of him or even Dean Smith ahead of him. First of all, three national championships that's tied for the fourth most all time, alongside Bob Knight, alongside Jim Calhoun. On top of that, he also had, and this is incredible, he had 18 regular season conference titles, nine in the Big 12 slash Big 8. That's how long ago Roy Williams started. He coached the Big 8 before it became the Big 12, and then nine more conference titles after he got to North Carolina for a total of 18 regular season titles in the Big 12, Big 8, and ACC. On top of that, and I think this is important, by the way, nine Final Fours, and that was the big knock on Roy Williams forever. Oh, he can't win the big one. He can't win the big one. He can't win the big one. Get into the Final Four. Well, as it turns out, from 2005 to 2017, he wins three national titles. So he's kind of the reverse Bob Knight. Took him forever to get that first one. And then his final, I guess it was 17 years, wins three national titles. Not bad at all. What I would also say about Roy Williams is this. He had success late into into his career. Now, I know when he retired last year, he said there's a better person for the job and blah, blah, blah. And we'll see what happens with Hubert Davis. But what I would say about Roy Williams, you look at his final couple years, Guy was pretty much on top of his game. Goes to a national title game in 2016, is a play away from potentially winning that one. That was the one where Villanova hit the shot at the buzzer. 2017, he gets back, does win a national title over Gonzaga. 2019, he wins the ACC regular season title, the year that Zion was at Duke. Zion gets hurt. Roy Williams in North Carolina win an ACC regular season title. So to me, that is why I give Roy Williams credit because I sit there and say, you know what? That is a guy that basically was able to um, was basically able to uh, you know have success late into his career so Roy Williams number five I'm already going long number four drum roll, please. do not be a homer I'm gonna go Jim Calhoun UConn and I know some of you still say oh he's a homer always this always that well first of all I do think where you win titles matter so first of all more national championships from Jim Calhoun than Dean Smith then Jim Beheim, then John Thompson, then Lute Olson, then Jerry Tarkanian, all these guys that routinely get mentioned ahead of Jim Calhoun, Rick Pitino, another one, Tom Izzo, Bill Self, for that matter, right now, Jay Wright. Jim Calhoun has three. Those guys have two. Those guys have one. Those guys have zero. And so to me, I don't know how Jim Calhoun can't be at number four, especially when you consider where he did it. I do think this matters. Starts out at UConn in the Big East. UConn was a nice regional program before he got there. They were not a national power. They were not a program that was going to Elite Eights and Sweet Sixteens and Final Fours. As a matter of fact, they were the worst team in the Big East when he got there. And how about this? He did What he did was so impressive because it was in the toughest conference in college basketball at the time. So one th- and this is not a disrespect. It's going to sound like it. It's one thing for Mark Few to build Gonzaga into a program that wins its conference every year. In a, in a conference that's a one to two bid league. Jim Calhoun entered the Big East at the toughest time in the conference's history when he got there. His first year, there were five Hall of Fame coaches. Lou Carnesecca at St. John's, Rolly Massimino at Villanova, Rick Pitino was in his first year at Providence, um, John Thompson at Georgetown, and Jim Beheim at Syracuse. That's five Hall of Fame coaches when he gets there. P.J. Carlissimo, by the way, was at Seton Hall. He would go to a Final Four National Championship game a year later, two years later. And so I bring it up because this guy comes in to the toughest conference in college basketball and builds a power, builds a monster that ultimately ends up with three National Championships and four Final Fours. On top of that, Jim Calhoun, and he's talked about it on this show. He's a friend of the Aaron Torres pod. This was a guy that took so much pride in winning the conference. Ten Big East regular season titles again in what was the toughest conference in college basketball at the time. Seven Big East tournament titles. And what I would say is a lot like Roy Williams. He had success late in his career. Took him a while to get that first one, but from 99 until he stepped away at UConn in 2013, 
three national titles, four Final Fours in his final five years, two Final Fours in a national title. And it's worth noting, like I'm not going to totally discredit Kevin Ali here, but Kevin Ali basically won a national title with his players in 2014. Three national titles, four Final Fours for Jim Calhoun, plus his basically a roster that he almost entirely put together wins the title in 2014. Number three, and this one might be a little bit controversial, and I was going to put him at number four, put Calhoun at number three. I am going to put Adolph Rupp at number three. Now, he's the one that kind of transcends so many eras that it's kind of hard to put into perspective what he did and how he did it because there's the NIT and there's the NCAA tournament and there's this and there's that. This was a stat that jumped out to me about Adolph Rupp. 27 SEC titles. 27! And I'm not sitting here saying I'm a SEC basketball historian. I can tell you that in 1954, how good the conference was or whatever. 27 SEC titles. On top of that, four national championships, third most all-time behind Wooden and Coach K. I know that there was this stuff about race and this and that. I've said it on this show a couple times. First of all, you, I'm, I don't want to dismiss what he is accused of in his ear. But what I would also say is this. There are a lot of people that have played for him and that knew him that say that simply what has been reported about him throughout history was not true. Uh, he did sign African-American players late in his career. Um, so it's not, I'm not saying he's a perfect human being, but when you look at the on the court results, when you look at, uh, you know, the, the, what, what happened, you know, just between the white lines, this was a guy that had so much success, 27 SEC championships, four, uh, four national championships. And also on top of that six final fours, uh, again, there's some stuff on his personal life, that's not great. There's some stuff in his professional life that's not great. But again, he signed African-American players. The first African-American player that ever played for him, Thomas Paine, said that some of the stuff that's reported about him isn't true. I'm going to take that over what some guy on Twitter or Facebook says about him. But this guy, win-loss results were incredible. What's interesting about him, too, he retired at the age of 70. And he did it, um, and he did it because, by law, they had, he had to step away at that particular moment in time. By law, he had to step away at the age of 70 years old, and he was having a ton of success when he was, at, even at his extended age, three Elite Eights in his final five years. As I said, four national championships, uh, six Final Fours, eight off Rupp is number three. Number two is our old buddy Coach K. And I know a lot of people want me to pull him down the list with Coach K, but first of all, the, again, to use a, a term that I just made up, the countable statistics, I mean, it's incredible. Most Final Fours ever for Coach K, which is 12, 12 including this year. Um, on top of that, five national championships, which is second most all time behind John Wooden. And what really stands out to me about it is two things with Coach K, and they're, they're kind of intertwined. One is his longevity. Okay, so this, I was thinking about this. So uh, about two months ago, it was the beginning of March. If you remember, I missed an episode because I came down with a death flu. Couldn't get out of bed for three days. Well, in my haze of having the flu, I was trying to drink some Gatorade and survive. I didn't have COVID, by the way. I tested negative three times. But um, in the process of, of trying to get better, there was one day I'm sitting there, and on ESPNU, I think it was, they're playing the 2001 National Championship game between Duke and Arizona on ESPNU. And I'm sitting there watching it, and something struck me. Coach K started his career at Duke in 1980 plays for a national championship in 2001, and I am old enough to remember that game, and I remember watching that game being like, man, this Coach K guy's been around forever. I can't even remember life without Coach K because Coach K had been at Duke since before I was born, and it felt like at that moment he had been at Duke forever, 21 years at that time. For some comparison, Coach Cal John Calipari feels like he's been at Kentucky for a while. John Calipari is going into his 14th year, so it would take seven more years to get to Coach K in 2001, and that was the halfway point in his career. 21 years at that point, and then he coached another 21 years, and he had a team this year that was good enough to win it all, and I know you can argue, well, you know, I mean, he underachieved all those one and dones, blah, 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 this and that, and I don't know that I even necessarily disagree with that, but what I would also say, well, it's easy for me to sit here and say that he underachieved late in his career with all that talent, like he did make a bunch of Final Fours late, he did make uh, when, when we're looking at the final few years of his career, he made a Final Four in his last year with a team good enough to win it. He made an Elite Eight with Zion. He made an Elite Eight with Marvin Bagley. He won the national title in 2015. And so I'm sitting there saying, like, we can criticize this guy because he didn't win a ton at the end with the best teams in college basketball. 
But, I mean, when you're talking about four Elite Eights from 2012, 2015 to 2022, it's hard for me to criticize them. So J- Coach K comes in at number two. And then number one, I'll just say this. It's John Wooden. And listen, I, I understand that when you look at John Wooden and you look at some of the stats that, that he put up, you're just like, come on now. That, uh, I mean, that could never happen in the modern era and blah, 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 and this and that. And I understand why that argument would be made. What I would also say is, when you look, first of all, when you look at those stats, it's almost like looking at like Wilt Chamberlain's stats from his days in the NBA, right? Like you just look at Wilt Chamberlain's stats and you're just like, oh my, that guy averaged like 50 points a game in one season, and he averaged like 50 and 20 the next year, and he averaged like 42 and 12, and then one year he led the, and like the stats are so crazy that you like, you're like, how is this even possible? And that's kind of the deal with John Wooden. I'm not saying that in this era he would win 10 of 12. I get all that. I get it was a different world. But the guy did win 10 national championships in 12 years, which is absolutely unbelievable. It was 10 in his final 12 years, so that makes it even more impressive is that he went out at the top of his game, won a national championship in his final season, 15 pack, whatever it was at the time. It's pack 12 now. I think it was pack eight at the time. Um, And, you know, it's just, I mean, you just look at the, the, the numbers. It's unbelievable. 15 conference championships, 10 national championships, Uh, three undefeated seasons, two back-to-back undefeated seasons, and I don't care how much better his players were than everybody else. You can't coach ball. Your team's not going 30-0 and every year. And so to me, John Wooden's number one. I get that it's a different era. I get that nobody could do what, you know, what he has done. Um, but John Wooden to me is number one. He comes in at number one on my list. So that is my top five coaches in the history of college basketball, which really turned into a list of top seven. Uh, Number seven is Dean Smith. Number six is Bobby Knight. Number five is Roy Williams. Number four is Jim Calhoun. Number three is Adolph Rupp. Number two is Coach K. And number one is John Wooden. 